Welcome to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University. I'm your host, Ivan, and along with the staff and students at Belgorod State University, I have taken it on myself to try to explain how Russians do business. In this episode, we'll meet a man who has made himself a pretty penny or two in a land of opportunity. The words Russian businessman do not conjure, at least in the Western mind, the image of a pseudo salary man giving a presentation, or a text of a hipster tapping away on their laptop in a coffee shop. Instead, if such a creature can be imagined at all, he, for it is invariably he, looks like whatever you imagine a gangster to look like. That is also the stereotype imagined by very many Russians. Like all stereotypes, it has its roots in reality. In the case of the 90s, some people were able to amass fortune seemingly from nowhere. And Russia, along with Ukraine, experienced something very like the lawlessness of the American West in the post-Civil War period. A wild east, so to say. Putin put an end to that, get it? And owes his genuine popularity to the fact. That period, known charitably here as the dashing 90s, is in the process of being mythologized in Russian culture. If you can imagine a cross between The Godfather and The Lone Ranger, or The Sopranos and CSI for our younger listeners, then you are not far wide of the mark. A distrust of and disinterest in money in general was a hallmark of Soviet life. In the perfect worker's paradise, money was a function of a command economy. Having it could mean very little. For the confused, I shall explain a little. Let's say that you are a young person in the late 1960s in the USSR, and you wish to impress another young person with your good taste and awareness awareness of contemporary trends. Ideally, your date would go smoothly if you could play a record by The Beatles and score a nice bottle of wine to oil the wheels of romance. You have also become aware of a trend for flat trousers and feel that wearing this would guarantee an optimal experience. In the West, the acquisition of the above-mentioned items would involve a trip to three shops and parting with some of money acquired by walking through the week or a small slice of your student grant or, let's say, even a loan from a friend or relative. Simple enough, but our young Soviet has it a little rougher. For a start, the Beatles are not on the list of contemporary acts currently allowed for pressing by Melodia, the people's record-producing organ of state. Comrade, why don't you listen to the genetic facsimile of German Schlanger music? Or, better still, here is the latest version of Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker. No thanks. Well, thinks the young person, at least I can drown my sorrows with a nice bottle of Italian, French, Spanish or even German wine. Actually, our young comrade would never think that, because the only option for wine is Georgian. If you like sweet wine, then you are in for a treat. If not, there is Soviet champagne, but your date may be not impressed if you pop the cork too early. Anyway, the shop has only beer, vodka and cognac from Armenia. No luck there. Well, okay, what about the flares? <laughs> you must be joking. Your mom promised that she would talk to your uncle Yuri, whose neighbor works at the tailors, to see if they have any offcuts that she can stitch into your trousers. But on the nice new ones, these will be only for weddings and funerals. This is the final straw. You explode into tears of frustration and self-pity. Your mom is impressed enough that she mentioned it to the war veteran who runs the local apartment block council. He's sympathetic. He was young once. Why shouldn't a young person have wine and special trousers? if they wanted. The Beatles? He's not sure about them. Never heard of them, even. He has a nice bottle of wine in the fridge, and he's not a big drinker. So, that solves one problem. The Beatles album is German, and you need to borrow it from your brother's friend, whose uncle brought it back from his military service in East Germany. It is a jealously guarded treasure, and him lending it to you is scratches on the vinyl, for which he will never be forgiven. This may take strategy. This problem needs work. Now for the trousers. It turns out that the fashion issue is one that the leaders of the Soviet Union take seriously. Last year, they set up a committee to decide on the best way of producing garments that were more colorful and fashionable. The previous year, a state committee on demographics concluded that more needed to be done to encourage Soviet citizens to procreate, and they recommended that more contemporary conveniences be made available. Washing machines and showers should be produced, along with stylish clothes. This will encourage young comrades to hurry up and produce more citizens. As luck would have it, the State Committee on the Modernization of Garment Production and Distribution has recently given the go-ahead for the production of flared trousers, in accordance with Polybura Order Number 5672193A Subsection C Paragraph 2. 
The new order will be sent to the state planning central office in Moscow for immediate action. Comrades, there is no time to lose. Flares for the people. And so the vast state bureaucracy lurches into action. Fabric requisition orders are issued in accordance with the recommended design for the larger trousers. These are ratified by individual republics in the USSR according to perceived needs. But there are questions. Producers ask their party officers exactly where they are supposed to find the extra cotton. We will need to divert it from other planned orders or obtain new machines and fertilizers to increase yield. And that won't be this year, comrade. Where are we supposed to acquire purple dye, comrade? What sizes are needed, comrade? How many of each size and color and gender? How should we price them? Well, you can see that this is no easy task. Within two years, you may find a pair of flats that fit you in Moscow, for example. The year after that, they may be available in other large cities. But in the small town where our Amherst Young Soviet had their temper tantrum, flares will be in the local store long after they have children of their own. By then, the fashion will be for drain pipe trousers. But you will only be able to buy flares, and they won't be in your size. And you will have to have them altered. To this day, Russia has a thriving tailoring sector. At least now, though, you can have a Beatles record, but the prevailing trends is for hard rock and disco. Bring me Led Zeppelin and Bonnie M. In the end, our frustrated young lovers went for a picnic with beer and sandwiches. And the soundtrack was provided by the local river and attendant wildlife. Not bad, but not good either. Like I said, money didn't matter in that scenario. There was nothing to buy that was worth paying for. If you wanted something quickly, you turned to the black market and used foreign currency. This was out of the reach of most Russians, even if they could hold their nose long enough to do business with the criminal classes. You also risked a lot by engaging with this sort of activity in the 60s. Alternatively, you used your political connections to jump the queue. What queue? I hear you ask. Well, the queue is really a list. When your name reaches the top of the list, you receive whatever is on it. From cars and houses to washing machines and power drills, for example. This was shopping in a common economy. This may be one of the reasons that vodka became such a problem in the 80s, that Gorbachev banned it. By the time unrestricted monetary warfare commenced in 1991, with the formal end of the Soviet Union, there were four powerful groups vying for control of Russia's economic future. First was the government. Their advantage was seemingly obvious. Well, they called the shots. The second group were the state economists and financial directors, from whose ranks the oligarchs emerged. The third group were the foreign venture capitalists. And the fourth group was the criminal underworld, whose stash of foreign currency and existing connections to trading networks on the border, whose stash of foreign currency and existing connections to trading networks on the borders of the former USSR gave them a significant head start. Here are four reasons why Russians do not trust the money among them, or should I say among us. However, this was then, and this is now. Russia has some of the most favorable business and personal tax rates in the world. The bureaucracy involved in starting and running a business is broadly in line with what you would expect anywhere in Europe. And regulation is fairly light. Businesses that pay their taxes are left alone to do their thing, and only examined if they violate the law in some way, pretty much as you would expect. The stability forced by the current regime has produced the desired effect. People are able to plan their futures with reasonable certainty. An investment in property is unlikely during rapid price inflation or business foreclosure, as is a commitment to producing offsprings or saving for a holiday. The Russian middle class is expanding, though slowly, and poverty levels, while still significant in rural areas, are falling in urban centers. If you're wondering how sanctions impact Russian business, then you might be surprised to learn that it has largely benefited local businesses to the detriment of foreign investors. And really, it is only luxury goods that have become more expensive. As an economy, Russia could be entirely self-sufficient, but is still lagging in production technology, a gap which is rapidly reducing. As a partnership with China strengthens, sanctions will lose all their bite if they haven't already. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Before we hear from our main guest, Alexey Baranov, I sat down with my co-host Ian and our friend Evanson to chat about our experience of business, which in my case was very limited, to say the least. Those two, it seems, are full on capitalists as well as academics. If you're wondering what happened to Ian, don't worry, he's currently teaching somewhere out in the forest, no doubt provoking strong reactions from the fauna with his guitar and questionable tasty music. So for now, please suffer through my editorials. Anyway. 
Ian Ledoff, he's quite pushing, you know. Welcome. We have guests in the studio today to discuss business in Russia, in Haiti, in Britain, where I'm from, and what we think about that. Let's introduce our first guest. It's Ivan. Hello, Ivan. I'm still a guest here. Uh, well, actually, no, you're not a guest, are you? Let's introduce our co-host Yay. and uh, all-round superstar. It's Ivan. Promotion. How are you feeling? Um, um... <laughs> well, uh, yeah, as usual. Okay, well, we have a special guest, don't we? And that special guest today is Evanson. Hello, Evanson. Hello, hello, everybody. So, Evanson, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? I was born in Haiti. I'm usually like a Caribbean part, like the rough side, the rough Indians part in the Central of America. You Central know, America, yeah. yeah well, I suppose the Caribbean, Central America. Yeah, sure. Does that count? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a highland. Uh -huh. and they're like near Cuba and but before like we share like the same territory with like Dominican Republic it was before one land but after we divided like two lands like Haiti and Dominican and which town are you from I'm Capetian yeah Capetian. nice t nice place like yeah, Belgrade yeah, yeah. yeah Canada but we have more attractive stuff there than Belgrade because Canada so I can say so close city but we are more open because we have seas we have beaches and many stuff make it like feel more open in city than Lemberg World. So you, it's a tourist kind of place. Sure. So business is the theme for today. You grew up there. Were you always involved in business from a young age? Yeah, sure. So what was your first job? Do you remember? Um, my first job is, I remember when I was like a teenager, at, at that time we have like a water problem in Haiti. I think we spent almost more than five months without like the water because there is one organization who control that because it's like Oxfam and they still have problem. And at the time, my dad used to go somewhere, take for, uh, like a bot or take it. I don't know where you take it exactly. And I used to sell it like everybody come with your stuff and I sell it. It's one of, uh, of experiences for me. So was it water you were selling? Yeah, sure. So drinking water? Yeah, drinking water, yes. And how old were you then? I remember so, yeah, I was maybe 10, 11 years old, like something like All that. All right, so you started early, yeah, right? Yeah, and my, my mother is the economist, is a businesswoman. I learned it also from her because she worked by herself. What did she do? A meat seller. She sells uh, meat from all the restaurants in the city. Oh, wow. She doesn't butcher the meat, though. <laughs> she does, she's not a butcher. She's a, a meat seller, yeah? A meat seller, yes. Wow. So you were surrounded with business. What did your dad do when they fixed the water? After, my dad as a professional is an operator, is a world constructor or something like that. So construction and selling and buying, and it's in your blood, yeah? Sure. So you came to Russia to study? Yeah, first of all, I was, I'm a guy who interested about um, language. A language is kind of a station for me, it's kind of feeling for me. When I see a new language, it's something like push me to, to know what is it, like to join it, to go deeply. At the time, I, I decided to come to Russia. I, I was studying trees in, in Haiti, in the capital of Port-au-Prince, and I left and I came to Russia to have the new experience. The because new it was country. a different and exciting new language that nobody in Haiti spoke? Sure. Wow. Are you the only Haitian here? No. Before, yes, but after two, three years ago, too much care. Two more. So there are three people who actively speak Russian who are from Haiti. No, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I remember when I was in the capital, there's um, the Russian school. I think it was, uh, this teacher was a Haitian and maybe his wife is, uh, is Russian. Oh, right. I see. Yeah, so so there, there's uh, like a Russian class. But very few, right? Yeah, it's not so popular as as the others, like English or French or Spanish. Yeah, I can imagine. There's a, there's a good few English people knocking around, or British people in Russia at the moment, I think. I'm one of them, but I'm very, there are very few of us in Belgrade. Yeah. In fact, only two. Yeah, two years ago, I was, I was, two years ago, I was the only one Asian in Belgrade, but after... <laughs> were, really... were you lonely? <laughs> yeah, I was so lonely. <laughs> I have only Latino or uh, African friends, but right now, yes, yeah, too much. Coming back to business, does it feel different for you, Russian way of doing business from Haitian way? I think business is like um, universal language, I can say. Yeah. Um, there's nothing like different, but the most important is the strategy. The strategy, how you are going to involve, how you are going to get the people, how you are going to make like the monopoly in your business. You're listening to Understanding Russia. First of all, 
as a you know I, I'm studying also international relationships I know like social I know what people want I know how they think it really is something really important if you want to be a businessman you should know your society what they are in need of and where they are located also so social engineering making people want what they want knowing what they want and selling them what they want one thing came in my life is t- like teaching is something that I didn't, I didn't see myself as a teacher but um, well from my Instagram I received many offers like they meant I think actually when I see myself uh, as a teacher because three years ago like I'm serving in uh, high school in Russia and Bengal exactly oh so you are not only a businessman but also a teacher and teacher and I remember like from two months ago like I went to I received a message um, from Maradujni political from um, Shebekino alright okay. yeah I went there for a conference uh, I did the conference like integration of young and uh, the politics uh-huh. yeah I went there it was really so cool meet people meet um, other stuff and something so so, so you're always me. selling that's the old salesman adage always be selling yeah ABCs and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, always be closing yeah okay, okay, okay. and then uh, one thing also we do not only me because we have one organization they call LU is a Russian education and it's kind of we bring st- um, students from the Latino part Latin America to Russia like Colombia Ecuador Haiti and Mexico and all the stuff and I'm one of the staff um, who represent Haiti from this uh, organization wow so you're so successful you brought two more Haitians to Belgorod yeah yeah there's, 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 <laughs> one, there's one more Haiti and they, they come f- to me <laughs> they came, they came for yeah, you sure. I'm sure you're instrumental in getting other people from Latin America. Do they like it here? I think yes. Why? It's advantage for them because university is more expensive in, in America oh. than in Russia. Uh, for example, what I pay here for one year in, in Haiti is like three months. Oh my. You understand? That, that's a big difference. Sure. Is there a problem of language barrier because, well, obviously not everyone speaks English and not everyone speaks Russian, so... Um, actually, in Haiti, like, um, people speak Creole. Creole is the deformation of French. Mm. Our Creole, like, edition Creole, is the deformation of French. But it's a pure language also because it has alphabet, everything. It's a pure language, like, if a language is also we speak French. But French, I think like 40% of the population speak French, but much people speak Spanish than, than French and they speak more English than French. It's something like to what I can't really understand it. You know, mm-hmm. we share boroughs like with Dominican Republic mm-hmm. and most people in my region is close to Dominican Republic. Like I can go by bicycle or by leg if I, if I want. They say that English is the language of business. Yeah. Would you sure. agree with that? Yeah, sure. Is that why you learned or did you just learn it anyway? No, I think that when I was a teenager, a younger boy um, language is something very important for me because I usually want to know because in Haiti we have many foreigners or Americans that come from like church stuff and like that and I remember when I was uh, I mean I usually go to school to church with my mom and when like American came like preaching in English only the pastor translate and he was like why, why you don't go to like to TOEFL take your TOEFL class and I want you to translate it for me before the, 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 um, the, the pastor the pastor and then I remember I was maybe 15 years old I entered um, TOEFL we have TOEFL in Haiti mm-hmm. this American school and I went there and I spent two years there I get my TOEFL every time I so you're fully qualified excellent so let's move to business in uh, in Russia generally Ivan you've lived in Russia uh, for a long time all your life Well, you could, you could say that and that will be true, yes. So um, what are your experiences of businesses here? Well, I have worked, if you can call it, in sales. I was a seller during, you know, some fates on open markets. So I was selling close to people, but it was when I was younger and it was in our little town or let's call it village. So it wasn't that difficult to sell because you pretty much knew everyone. Uh, <laughs> so who wants what? It was a medieval experience. Well, I I wasn't stopped even once, so it wasn't <laughs> exactly medieval, as you may say. That's a, that's a bonus, I guess, in this situation, not being stabbed. Yeah, so I'm not as closely 
acquainted with business side or more official side of business. So that's why I'm very interested to hear how you are going around and are you planning to expanding your business here in Russia or are you planning to changing or branching out? Business, the more you can expand it, the more it's um, advantage for you because you get more market, you get more people that like demand it. And when I'm working with my staff, I'm working with some cloth collections. I'm going to have my own cloth collection. We have one... Um, association I call like behind the scene, behind the society and it's a kind of mark also and there I'm going to have my own but I'm still working on it maybe a when fashion it, king yeah yeah sure wow and then I, I, I'm a guy also I like dressing like no you like, are a natty dresser my sure, friend sure. yeah so I mean that's it. some hat you came yeah, here with and that's why I get into this this stuff because I want to have my own mark and my own stuff collection so I don't think teaching is the future for you Evanson mm, no According to my career, I'm a diplomat. In my passion is about like international stuff and international politics. Is my passion is something I can spend like I can breathe without thinking about it. You understand? Right. So yeah, that's sure. your real calling. Yeah, sure. The business is just something you do like a hobby. Not hobby because if you are studying international relationship, it's a kind of um, know how to negotiate it. And in business, you can do business without know how to negotiate it with people. So that's true. Like, like automatically, is inside the business. So diplomacy and business for you go hand in hand. Sure. I suppose it's all psychology in a way, isn't it? Sure. I come from a very developed business background. I mean, Britain is the home of, I guess, international business. And capitalism. And capitalism and a lot of other things and financial dealings. Um, yeah. And uh, so for us, it's much more a societal thing. We have large corporations and you can work for them. And there's a very structural approach to that. If you serve for a long time, then you rise through the ranks and everybody has different skills that they bring to it. There's not a lot of freedom. I'll tell you that. If you are a market trader, you never really expand beyond that. I think in Russia, I've noticed that people who tell their stories about business have started a business that didn't go very well, or they branch out into another business and they use their success in one business to sponsor another one. And that's not a story you will hear a lot in Britain anymore. People will start businesses and they will maybe make a living, but we have such a corporate culture now. If you're very successful, the chances are that you'll be bought out. Mm. And if I have one restaurant, then I do very well and I get a second restaurant. By the time I have a third restaurant, I have people offering money for my brand. It's up to you whether you cash out or not. Yeah, sure. It's kind of what they offer you. Yeah. You're listening to Understanding Russia. And so what you'll find is that big chains of restaurants aren't just one restaurant. So we're used to thinking of corporations like McDonald's. I used to work for a company called TRG and they owned about seven or eight different brands of oh, restaurant. Wow. And they had 300 restaurants across, or at least 300 restaurants across the country. Oh. And they were making big money, as you can imagine, and they were reproducing that brand over and over again. And one of the things I noticed about Russia is there are brands, if you like. We have restaurants that do similar things in this city, but it's much easier to be a restaurant owner and a gym owner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in this country, it's much more common for people to branch into different aspects of business than it is in Britain. That's right. I told you, when you understand this, that your society, you are going to know what you can bring for them. Yeah. I mean, in a way... It's, it's like, a, like a doctor when you someone sick and you already know what kind of medicine, what kind of stuff you should offer, like, them. offer, offer them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the same like business. Yeah. And I think Russia is underdeveloped business environment, I think. What do you uh, think, Evanson? I can say no. Why I can say no? Because don't take um, Russia through Bergwald, you understand? Know if you go to St. Petersburg or you go to Moscow or Volgograd, something like that, there's many stuff. You see the youngest people, how they, they are involving in many stuff. You understand? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think like last month, I see Bergo, I see in Bergo, so they're trying to do this thing. They, they have a budget for, for, for like mm -hmm. the clever student to bring your own idea, your what everything you think, bring it to the table. They will help you to develop it. It's a kind of way also to bring all this stuff out. It is true. And, and finding people to sponsor you. There are a lot more sort of wealthy, independent people in this society than I've met. Most of the people who have money in where I came from, they've already had it for generations or they are high up in some kind of corporate structure. So and I think that's you, where you, where you, you feel that freedom there. You need like the uh, conservator or something like that. In a sense, it's, it's just a very developed business environment. There are no spaces to fill. So the only way to fill a space in British business would be to invent something everybody needs. Mm. And that's getting increasingly rare. So you feel your full freedom. 
Yeah. And I know a lot of people feel that way about the business that a lot of people are depressed about the work they do because they don't feel like they're innovating. They don't feel yeah. like they're making anything. But if we come back with the, like the Britain story, the Britain system is something like we know, like we know as how is so close to, they're close to themselves. And I can feel you, I can feel what you mean. Maybe it's going to affect also the society and the business ways also. People, when they get something, they're trying to get it only for themselves or for their family or for the new coming, you understand? It's so, a kind of individualism sure. you're talking about, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a strange mix because it's both individualism and corporatism, which is the sort of idea of a, a body politic of people doing the same thing for the same reasons. And there's a lot more, I suppose, I don't know about Russian business, but in uh, or Haitian business for that matter but there's a lot more litigation in western businesses that I find in America it's famous I mean people are suing each other all the time I mean the courts are full yeah, of people sure. and I don't think that happens in Russia as much I'm not sure Mm, I think no. Not in your experience. I mean, we have limited experience yeah, in businesses here. Right? Well, no, I would. I have never heard about litigation. Plus, I come from the village, so we all talk about uh, corporate products, uh, corporations. is somewhat alien to me because we know almost everyone who sells stuff. We know who owns this store. We know it's a family store, and this store is a family store, and this one is a family store, etc., etc. There were so no. So you're thinking about the macro business? Well, basically, yeah. There was. It's the only business, I think. There yeah. weren't any brand stores for a quite long time. Right now, they're popping here and there because our village is expanding and developing. So you can see some more uh, shops starting to open, and the family shops, unfortunately, starting starting to close because they cannot well rival. Prices. Mm. Uh, which, from, from which city are you from? Oh, uh, Barisovka. Barisovka. It's about 40 minutes from here, so it's not far from here, but it's not a huge town. So that's why I wasn't as closely acquainted with business stuff until I came here. So it was all alien to me. At start, I was only shopping at open markets because I, I was used to shopping at open markets, but... Now you go to the chain stores. I mean, there are some very big chain stores in Russia. I mean, it's, it's the same in that way. Yeah. But I think I still think there are openings for people who are sole traders who want to start. Oh, sure. If you want to buy meat in Russia, you never go to the chain store. You know a person who sells good meat, a butchery, let's, let's yeah, say yeah. it's a butchery. So you know what is good, what is bad. You can ask for something special, which you cannot do at chain store. But if you need to buy groceries, not something very specific. Of course, you will go to Pitorochka or Magnit or something like this. Because why waste your own time and time of the person just to buy, what, a sausage? I suppose it is about time as well, yeah? Right. Yeah, sure. So time is, is important to a lot of people. I suppose the corporate culture in Russia is creeping in quite fast. I've noticed that. But it's, we're still in a place where I think people are free to start their own businesses. But, I mean, the economic crises that happen in Russia, I, this is the strange thing. When the sanctions started and people started to say, well, there won't be enough money going around in Russia, surprisingly few places shut. Because I don't think, if you're, the, this strange optimal reason to be in a, an under, underdeveloped economy is that it's not as affected by global trade and global tariffs and all these things as, as it would be if you were in Britain. If Toyota decided to pull out of Britain for some reason, it would affect the lives of thousands and thousands of people and whole towns would collapse as a result of that. If a Hochland was decided to pull out of Russia, it would affect very few people because there would always be another job opening up to supply what Hochland used to supply. So I don't think the, the lack of internationalization in Russian business is probably what saves us from the worst of the these economic problems. Well, I wouldn't say there is a lack of international business because we have international businessmen right here, first of all. <laughs> and second of all, I think most of international businesses in Russia is enormous. So it's oil, it's materials, it's metals, etc, etc. So only the richest were affected by it. Well, the largest, one of the largest yeah. companies yeah. in the world yeah. is Gazprom, isn't it? So, so I can't agree with you. But you see, that doesn't affect us every day necessarily. Um, and I, I think that's it's, it's still a case of an unregulated environment to a large extent here in Russia. Yeah, pretty sure. You know, Russia is you not know, as like um, the environment it is. So, but just think, we can like pretty sure with it, like pretty closely with our decision because we need um, a statistic because we are we are dealing with science. You understand? Mm -hmm. You're listening to Understanding Russia. It's kind of we can just talk about it, but we can say for like we are so sure, 
so sure about what we say, you understand? Well, it's generally from our experience. I mean, the thing is, if we were to have uh, a program devoted to economics in its purity, then we would obviously, we would probably not participate. <laughs> the, the, three, the three of us not having the economics chops to make a, a difference to that one, we would simply be asking questions, I think. Yeah, sure. But having said that, I mean, I've worked in business. I worked in business for a long time before I came here. I was 20 years involved in businesses. Yeah, it's your experience. Oh, well. Yeah, so in my experience, economics has very little to do with it. If you, if you talk about pure economics and theory and management theory and things like that, business at its heart is a very simple proposition. I have something you want to buy. So it's like you said, it's sociology, knowing what people want. Yeah, and supplying it. It's supply side economics. It's it's the idea that I have a need, a basic need, or I have a desire. And in times of difficulty, I supply my needs and not my desires. And in times of plenty, I just I supply my desires. And and it is fundamental to our society. So I I think that even if you if you want to talk about economics, it's almost pointless. Yeah, sure. And uh, one thing I uh, we, I pretty when I remember I remember like in in Haiti, people they eat more goat than than ox. And when we find out. That, I told my mom, so we, we have to buy more more goats than than ox. And at that time, we sell more um, goats than 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 ox, and we we raise up the price. Why we raise up the price? Like a little bit, because we understood that the people, the demons, are going to to the goats. And this thing, you have to be pretty intelligent. You have to be a, something who good and analyze, analyze something like that to see what the people want. Yeah, pay attention. Want. Yeah, sure. And when we realize that, and we bought, we bought like more goods than beef, and we make profit, big profit with it. Yeah, but I mean, there's also the idea of creating a, a demand. I mean, a large number of businesses now try to engage in social media to try to create demand. But what's remarkable to me is how advertising doesn't really work anymore. It's much more like word of mouth. The existing brands that there are on the market in Russia are trusted to a large extent and new brands don't get a look in. Except when they use Instagram and marketing through word of mouth, through popularity, that's the only way it seems possible now to advertise. Old models of buying and selling are falling away, I think. What do you think of that? Um, I think, but we got something we should forget about it, the, um, the, the evolution of the internet. People, they don't have time. For example, it's better like they have an electronic book or the audio book than to have the book. See, one of people, the more shortly it is, the more they like it. No one will sit here or to, to listen to us as a pastor, like to listen to us like that. Mm -hmm. It's better like that. For example, it's better when like they stay home or they have their headphone, they listen about us. But no one, I think people want to, the more shortly it is, the more they like it. The more simply I can say it. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I have to say that in, in the sense that people have a short attention span, that idea, yeah? I would say this is true because how popular all this TikToks nowadays and short stories on you VK. Imagine, you get one guy from Italy, you get more popular, you get popular from what? You just take some video and you just do like that. Yeah, but you see this idea of lifestyle, right? I, I think there are certain things in which you don't want to spend time doing them. For some people, shopping is a pleasure and they'll spend a long time doing it and they'll browse through websites and they'll go to shops and they'll do that because it's a lifestyle choice they make. Mm -hmm. For the rest of the, but you don't do that for toilet paper. Right? You, you have a brand of toilet paper, you go buy the toilet paper. You don't browse through Instagram to see who's using what toilet paper, right? Mm. <laughs> That's not well, true. Well, maybe you do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I would browse for toilet paper. I have, heard, I have only heard about Instagram. I don't know what it is. Oh, right, yes. Of course, really? you're from the village. Yeah, I'm yeah, from yeah. the village. I, I, I have learned to use VK only recently, so I'm not as technically minded as I other people. I get you, I get you. But I think there are certain things that you want long... You know, if you're going for a, a pedicure or something, you want that to be a long experience. You don't want to be in and out. So it's mostly about how costly it is. If you're buying a car, of course, you will not go and buy the Sky C because it's a serious investment. Toilet paper is not an investment. Right, that's what I'm saying. It's an so I, I don't think you can apply one model to the way we shop. So Evanson was making the point, well, people don't have the attention span. They don't want to spend that time doing it. There are things they want to spend time doing, right? We all want to spend time doing the things we like the best. So the things we don't like, we'll flip through it as quickly as possible. But people don't un advertise toilet paper on Instagram. They advertise, advertise phones uh, plus... Uh, what, what no, no, I'm no. Not... They, they do. But every, every company will advertise on Insta and social media. They will all advertise on these things, right? Whether people actually pay any attention to them, I don't know. But one of the things that happens now is promo codes. So as soon as you shop on Amazon or Amazon or whatever platform you're using, 
Alibaba. You look for well, a promo this, code like, um, so you get your discounts. That's discount, it. The discount, yeah. yeah. The most is higher, the most you are interested and the most you go for it. But I think that's a loss as well because if you like the product, you'll buy it. I don't, I don't think you'll, you, if you care about getting 10% off, you know, I'm not going to spend it. I'm not going to spend an extra five pounds or five, you know, 500 rubles getting what I want because there's no promo code. I but don't think that happens. But there are people who will buy stuff and that they of, don't want yeah. and don't need because they have promo code. That's capitalism, baby. <laughs> Simple, like today today they put like iPhone and if you buy the iPhone like 20 26 to to, to 30 um you have discount 15 or 50 percent even though you, you don't have the plan oh my god I see it and so quickly you, you buy it without any plan you don't Impulse have, it's, buying. Not, it's not even your own but it's their plans you get me they yeah, yeah no, I, you to buy it, it does work but there's also an alternative right would you buy a Mercedes for a thousand pounds no you wouldn't right because you know there was a problem with that or it's not a real Mercedes so th there's all sorts of psychology behind selling I would But disagree other stuff. I wouldn't buy Mercedes from some shady car dealer <laughs> if it was official car Mercedes car dealer who will be selling Mercedes for a thousand pounds maybe that's how for example iPhones are sold I'm not going to buy iPhone for ten thousand rebels from a shady guy who will pull out his coat and show me yeah. a selection of phones but if it's an official retailer like Beeline or Cifra Market or DNS, etc., etc. Of course I will buy because, well, they get... You trust all, them. They give warranty. And second of all, that's the whole point. No oh, warranty? Yeah. Oh, I get it. I think you mean... Guarantee? Like... No, there is no guarantee. Ah, sure. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, well, that's we're straying Even into legal territory there, now. There is no discount. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like efficient. Yeah, yeah. You'd say, well, this thing, I'm going to say it's 60,000. I, yeah, I know it's worth 50,000, so I'm going to sell it for 50,000 and say there's a discount. I mean, that's all psychology as well. I don't think you can apply one model to business at all. I think there's several different ways of people buying. It depends on the character again. You know what I have reached throughout all this conversation? What have you found is out? that economics has nothing to do with business. It's all psychology and sociology. No, no, no. It's, no, no. it's a part of it. It's a part of it because we can't do business without them. Economics. It's, economics it's, is voodoo. <laughs> it's yeah, voodoo. It's voodoo. voodoo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, sure. I know what you mean. <laughs> I mean, it is. I mean, honestly, I used to read economics when I was a student, I gave up. I read a, an article by a guy called J.K. Galbraith, who was one of the greatest economists of all time. And in it, he said, no economist knows what they're talking about, including myself. And the reason is, whenever there's a collapse in the market, nobody predicted it. That's it. Nobody ever predicts the collapse in the market. That's the end of, that's the end of it, as far as I'm concerned. Economics is voodoo. And he knows about voodoo, and he agrees with me. Therefore... No, yeah, I get, I get, <laughs> your, friend, I get your friend, but... That's why he's so good at this. He's very good. He's voodoo man. <laughs> <laughs> no, not all Asians are good at business. It's so oh, stereotypes. well, stereotypes is what we're dealing with here. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a peasant. I'm allowed to be bigoted. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, and I'm I'm British, so we have a tradition of being bigoted. So uh, that's that's it. Well, thanks very much, guys. It's been a really nice chat yeah, we've had about yeah. business. We should do this again sometime without the microphones. Sure. So I thanks for coming. You're listening to Understanding Russia. I'm not quite sure all that helped, but onwards and upwards, our interviewer Dmitry met up with Alexei Baranov to find out about the realities of business in contemporary Russia. They discussed the highs and the lows, and he started by asking him, in true business fashion, to give us an overview of his career, up to the point where he became the proprietor of a local hostelry. That has a special place in Dmitry's affections. I'm quite a young businessman. My first real business was a barber shop, then a bar. Before that, I worked odd jobs. I would come to Belgorod on business trips. There was a kitchen furniture store here, and that's where it all started. Did you go to university? No. Well, about education, I had a lower secondary education and I graduated from night school. Then I had a rather long break in education. I graduated from Link as an adult. It's a business school of sorts. Uh, it is like an MBA in international management. What did you do next? I was looking to see if I fit anywhere. I tried to get a job from 91 to 93. I took whatever job I could get. I met a friend who assembled furniture. He brought me in. I've been in the furniture business since 95. Today, our store is still open. At first, I assembled furniture, worked security, sold furniture. Then I made manager. And in the end, I bought it all out. 
When did you move here? I used to come here on business trips once a month. I've been coming here on and off for the last 10 years. I moved to Belgrade permanently five years ago. What was your first business? Did you buy the furniture store before the Chop Chop Barber Shop or after? The first conscious business decision was Chop Chop. Chop Chop? Yes. Is it a... what do you call it? It's a barber shop franchise. Yeah, franchise. I knew nothing about hairdressing. It took me a while, but eventually... I got the hang of it. I knew nothing back when a friend came to me. I was traveling here from Smolensk all the time, and he came to me from Bransk. We decided to start a business and were considering different options. We decided to open a barber shop because back then it was kind of a challenge. A man cutting a man's hair and trying different hairstyles on him. At the time in Russia, it seemed unusual to a lot of people. That's what attracted me. And that was how many years ago? Six years ago. It was a challenge on the six years ago. Back then, if a man walked out of a barber shop, everyone thought he was gay or something. Kind of sad. People didn't go to barber shops then. Uh, it wasn't a thing. Visitors came because they heard it was a cool place, but when they saw a barber, they refused to sit in his chair to get their hair cut. Am I going to get my hair washed by a man? It's never going to happen. It was that difficult at first. And they probably were grumbling and complaining about the prices. Of course. A haircut costs 100 rubles. That's $1.50. But why does it cost a thousand rubles, like 15 bucks here? But the results were amazing. It's cool to see a guy come in with one look and 40 minutes later he's completely transformed. Sure. I was surprised. It was so inspiring. Let's say I go to work, I look at people and I see ordinary people with their grumpy faces. But you can spot a person who has just come out of a barber shop right away. He has a happy grin. Why a barber shop? You were at the furniture business at the time and didn't know a thing about hairdressing, right? More than that, the industry wasn't popular at all. I've been handling both businesses simultaneously. I've been working in the furniture store my entire life. I had people to hand over responsibility to. I had some free time. One day, I was taking a walk in Smolensk and saw some cool guys through the window. It was the first barber shop in the city and then it hit me. There was no such thing in Belgorod. We began to consider various options, did a research, went to Moscow to see how all this works and that's it. I ran the furniture business alongside the barber shop. Let me ask you one more question about barber shops. You've mentioned Chop Chop. Can we talk about figures? Sure. How much does it cost to buy a Chop Chop franchise? At the time, a license was about 250 to 300 thousand rubles. That's about three and a half to four thousand dollars. That's the down payment, but it is considered essentially as the franchise itself. You buy a job description, a name, a lookbook, and rights. It was about twenty-five thousand, which is about three hundred and fifty dollars a month at the time. We paid three hundred thousand rubles. They gave us a sheet of paper with a couple of paragraphs printed on it, and that was it. That's how a franchise was formed back then. The franchise was granted pretty much by gentleman's agreement. So what was the point of buying the franchise? I gained access to professionals and their training courses. At the time, we started fitting out the shop. I went on a hairdressing course, and by the time I bought the franchise, I already had some skills. I knew how to wield scissors, and after all, I worked as a barber for a few months. And then I started managing. Do you know how Chop Chop Shops are doing in general? I mean, the company. Obviously, we live in a tough, competitive environment. When it all started, there were two or three barbershops in Moscow, but now there are maybe 30 or more. The sector has grown. In my opinion, barbershops where people are passionate about their business and are advantageous compared to other barbershops, they differ in style and in the quality of the pros. The top barbers there look really good, and in Yekaterinburg, Kazan and Voronish, they work at an Excellent pace. Okay, but I was referring to the Chop Chop brand itself, their franchise.
They're still afloat. Uh, I think they last probably from 70 to 80% of their franchises. In general, this area was slowly moving away from businesses and entrepreneurship into the realms of craftsmanship. The shops developed their own professionals who were not interested in working under the Chop Chop brand. You don't have to work for someone if you're a pro and you have accumulated a customer base. Then they took down the signs, terminated the contracts, and continued to work under their own brand. How long were you a Chop Chop franchisee? Four years. Four years. Was it lucrative? Yes, we made our money back then and sold the original shop. I would say that we made a lot of money selling it, but it was something. So we made our money back and then some. I consider it a successful project that brought me a lot of experience and some money. That project took Belgrade forward. This is one project I remember fondly. It was a good project. Yes, I'm very happy to hear that the business was lucrative. It really had a big impact on the service industry in Belgorod. I guess Chop Chop can be considered the first barbershop in Belgorod, right? Before Chop Chop, there was also a self-titled barbershop and a few more places like Cuthead. There are a lot of guys who work well even now. I know a few professionals scattered through all different barbershops. Some of them have opened their own shops. This is all thanks to you. But you have another business besides a pub. Is it true? We have a kitchen furniture store, a stretch ceiling store, and a pub. By the way, we recently closed a kebab shop. Why? Well, in six months, I never understood why it was so unprofitable. I didn't figure out how to make money from it. We had great dishes there. People wrote positive reviews, but it didn't bring us any money. So we decided to close it down and sell off the equipment. Okay, it wasn't making you any money, so you closed it. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Does it mean that the other three businesses, kitchen, furniture and the pub, are profitable? Kitchen, stretch ceilings and a pub. It was the first craft beer bar in Belgorod, right? Yes. Tell us more about your pub, please. Do you consider it your main project? Emotionally or financially? Emotionally. Yes, I love my pub. And financially? It comes in second. What's in first? Kitchens. Could you please tell us more about the pub? What's its theme? By the way, it's not big. Is that its thing? Yeah. We're always trying to make more room and expand the pub. Space. Now, it's the summer season. We have a summer house in mind. Before COVID, we added another 30 to 40 meters squared to the pub. It's bigger now, but still relatively small, about 140 meters square. You market yourself as a craft beer pub. What is your average bill? About a thousand rubles. Do you deliver? Not very often, because delivering alcohol is illegal. Uh, it is impossible to know the age of the person who made the order. We deliver food. It comes comes out to about 3% of the kitchen's revenue. Our theme is hosting guests inside. We rely on attendance. How has your pub been affected by the coronavirus pandemic? We closed down in March. I negotiated my rent down by 30%. Until reopening in June, we were running at a loss. The fact that at the time we had no supply debts and didn't owe salaries saved us. We quickly paid all the debts and faced the crisis in good conscience. After four months of nothing, there was a surge in attendance. Now, our attendance is excellent. And now, have you fully recovered? We need a about four more months. Has the pandemic hit you that hard? Yes, we have a huge rent bill, about 170,000 rubles. During the quarantine period, we went into the red. Okay, the pub closed for quarantine, but you paid rent and wages, am I right? Well, we didn't close completely. We shortened the workday and served the food through a window. We did it so we wouldn't have to fire people. It didn't bring in money quite the opposite. Were there other losses besides rent and salaries? No, that's it. Rent and salaries. And who proposed reducing the rent? I approached the landlord and he went along with it. So it wasn't a government initiative? No, the decision was purely commercial. We talked. He said he also had maintenance costs, loans for the buildings. It's understandable. I have nothing to complain about. I was lucky to have a 30% reduction. How do you start a small business in Russia? For 
For instance, I want to open a barbershop. What do I need to do? First of all, you need to be a professional. If you're going to work alone, you can work as self-employed. If you're going to work as an entrepreneur, you need to get a sole trader license, and that's it. What is the procedure? I don't know much about this because I registered as an individual entrepreneur in 2007. Now it seems to me that all that I have to do is apply for it on the public services website and come to a specific place to pick it up. Now everything is much simpler. I can tell you exactly how it works. The last thing we opened was an OOO, which is a limited liability company. About three years ago, we moved the existing LLC from Smolensk to Belgorod. It did not cost a lot of money either. What are the taxes? Payroll taxes are 43 to 44%. I took the earnings, subtract 44% and see how much goes to tax. I'm a little confused. I don't know anything about it. Let's say I go to a pub and spend 1,000 rubles there. What percentage of the sum goes to you? Okay, I have 1,000 rubles. I have to pay the fixed costs like rent, variable costs like utilities, pay salaries, pay the costs of maintenance and of the premises. We are constantly painting or repainting something. Then I subtract from the sum uh, the cost of food and count the money for broken utensils. And after that, I look at how much money I have left. Do you have to pay taxes on a regular basis? Of course. Property taxes depend on your square footage. What percentage of the thousand goes to you? I would be very happy if the profit is 12 to 15 percent. That's about 150 rubles. Do you have any statistics about the number of people going through the pub per month? No, if you look at how it works. We have counter service. We don't have waiters per se. Every client goes to the bar and buys something. How many times they come up in an evening, I can only guess. Usually two or three times. It's very hard to calculate that. Maybe they're buying for themselves, maybe for friends. We just don't take that into account. You can't count it. Let's get back to the topic of business in Russia. As an entrepreneur with experience, what do you think is better, to open a small business with your own savings or borrow money from a bank? Of course, it's good to have some savings at first. As you develop, you can apply for a bank loan. I think that's the best way. Do you often go to the bank? Rarely. Rarely or never? I've never gone to a bank for business purposes. Wow. Well, perhaps that's the reason for such modest growth. This could be a disadvantage. What are the reasons, if I may ask? God knows. I applied for a loan twice when I needed money, but the terms of the loan seemed too complicated for me. I needed some kind of bond or something. And the second time the interest rate was too high, I thought I could wait and do what I had in mind a little later. Was it personal savings then? Yeah. After the 19th experience, are you saying that taking loans is still risky? Well, you have to understand what you're doing. If you don't have any business goals, you'll fail, in any case, as I did with my kebab shop. In general, I understood where I was going, but the interest rate on the loan was higher than expected. It's a risk either way. If something didn't work out, I'd owe the bank. I hesitated. It takes a clear understanding of what you're doing and determination. I wouldn't say whether it'll do your business good or not. Maybe some people benefit from it and some people don't. I'm a complete amateur in this respect. Do I understand correctly that there are different types of loans for public and private legal entities? Yes. Okay, so if you have your own business, you can go to the bank and take a loan as a public entity anyway. I can still take out a loan for my own needs as a private entity. Is it legal? Sure. I can apply for loans as a legal and as a personal entity. This way I can pick a favorable interest rate. If I were willing to take more risks, I would take some money from the bank and invest it wisely. But I am hesitant to do it. I always find an excuse. That's why we develop at such a mild and slow pace. It's not about the banks, it's about your guts and determination. I've never been abroad, but I've heard that in Europe or more developed countries, the rates are more favorable 
people and people are willingly taking loans. They understand that they won't have to pay it back for a long time. But in Russia, the rates are too high. I'm sure that both in Europe and in Russia, there are many people who take advantages of loans and other kinds of state support. It's just not me. I've chosen another path. So, in a nutshell, I open a barber shop or kebab shop or whatever, register it on the public service website, fill out the documents, pay the fee, negotiate the rent with the landlord and get to work. Right. It's relatively easy. In the case of our kebab shop, we applied for the registry of a new business. We decided to affiliate the shop to my individual entrepreneur status. We chose the tax policy, notified Rospotrebnadzor, and that's it. Then you sign the contract with the landlord and start working. Do you have the right to hire someone with public entity status? Yes. Are there many inspections in the service sector? Not many. They do inspections only when something happens. If someone was poisoned, for example, we haven't had any emergencies of that kind. People from fire safety often come by to check, but only because we're in a mall, and that has a certain safety demand. The owner is required to follow safety regulations by alarms, smoke detectors, hoses and fire extinguishers. There have been no complaints to Rospadrebnadzor. There were a few complaints from neighbors. The police came, but we solved everything peacefully and asked the guests not to make any noise outside. So there are three authorities that can theoretically come to the pub. Police, fire department and Rospotrebnadzor. Yes. What does this Rospotrebnadzor do? The Russian Federal State Agency for Health and Consumer Rights is our national health and hygiene service. They look after food standards and safety, amongst other things. You're listening to Understanding Russia. So, if someone's had food poisoning from the undercooked kebab, the folks from this authority come in and inspect everything. Yes, there is a special booklet outlining all the necessary requirements. You receive it in the center for the provision of public and municipal services. Let's say you have to have tiled walls, washable surfaces, effective sewage systems, a contract with Ecotrans, uh, it is the local waste disposal company, a health permit for everyone who has access to food and separate streams for dirty and clean dishes. Now, there are also requirements for antiseptics and germicidal lamps. What's a health permit? A health permit is a permit to sell foods and drinks that are cooked or served to the public and which must be regulated for public safety. You go to Rospiratnadzor, they give your worker a six-hour lecture and that's it. Also, you need to get a medical checkup. So it's like a medical examination. Yeah, and also a little bit of food safety awareness. Do you include a service charge in the bill? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. Is that on principle? No, we often change the rules. We constantly reconsider whether to include service charge in a bill or not. Now we just pay everyone by the hour. They have a work day, it's divided into hours, we pay money for an hour. For a shift they can earn from 1500 to 2000 rubles. It depends on how much they work. The waiters make 1,500 to 2,000 rubles, 20 to 30 dollars per shift, right? Yes. How many shifts do they take a month? They choose the hours themselves. We have six waiters now, uh, although we need two or three. Some take fewer shifts because they study and combine their education with their work. Some work only on weekends. There are those who want to work every day, lunatics. But we have a few more experienced people who managers like giving shifts too, and a couple of useful idiots. Are they paid equally? Yes, they are paid by the hour. Do you decide who to give bonuses to? Yes, sometimes it turns out that instead of a bonus, I give them more shifts. This way one waiter can make 7,000 a month and the other 24,000. Their salary varies. Are there any tips? Well, it's a sensitive subject. Since we have counter service, bartenders get a tip more often. The waiters most often don't get any. And whether the bartender divides the tips among the waiters, technicians and the kitchen is a big mystery. I have nothing to do with it because it's almost impossible to control. And to be honest, I don't see the point. There are some tips that travel between the staff at the bar. Well, it's not my business. You have a tip jar, I've seen it. Some have jars. Others have personal cards or QR codes. Everyone is doing their own thing. 
whose jar is it? The bartenders or everyone's? The bartenders. And I don't think he shares. Maybe that's fair. Your waiters only take food out of the kitchen and clear the tables. Everything else is a bartender's business. Yes, he meets the guests, advises them on a selection of alcohol and helps to choose the appropriate drink. Is the waiter turnover high in your pub? I find it difficult to answer questions like that. I don't understand what is considered high. Of course, as an employer, I want stability. I want to have the best employees and I want them to stay for as long as possible. On the other hand, I realize that a waiter job is just an episode in a person's life and not a very pleasant one. If a person wants to get a job as a waiter, he's probably a student who needs money. I'm referring to our pub because in other bars and restaurants, waiters play a more important role. So a student earns a bit of money and goes on with their life. That means when a person comes to work at your pub, they stay for three months on average, right? Over this time, we need to train the new worker and then arrange for them to work in shifts. They work for a while and leave. The joke doing the rounds at the moment is that we are literally suppliers of the stuff for the bars of St. Petersburg. Recently, some of our barmaids got married and moved to St. Petersburg. Then a bartender moved to St. Petersburg. And that means our place may be considered as a springboard for people's careers. That is, if you work at Decabrist, you automatically move to St. Petersburg. And uh, the last thing that amused me was one local brewer from St. Petersburg contacted me and said, we have a bartender of yours, a bearded one. I said, that guy, he's excellent, hire him. And he replied, yes, it looks that way, we'll hire him. Uh, I mean, I have a good relationships with St. Petersburg bars and pubs, and we stay in touch. Maybe they should pay you then. I'm happy if they just provide good beer on a regular basis. Do you often change bartenders? Every year or a year and a half. They usually work for longer. And how much is bartender's salary? Oh, bartender. I think that's somewhere... Do we count tips? No. Sure, since we don't know how much tips they get, somewhere between 35 to 50,000 a month. Well, about 10 shifts a month from 12 to 16 hours each. Oh, wow. Yes. On their feet. On their feet. Well, of course, it's not like they stand at the bar for all 16 hours. Of course, there are rushes. That is, first you have to prep the bar, then there's, say, business lunch, during which you work for several hours in a row. Then there is a gap of four or five hours, and then there's an evening rush. Something like that. On weekends, uh, that's Friday and Sunday, we have extra staff on, as a backup shift, so to speak. Their shift is shorter, 8 to 12 hours. Do the service work the same shifts? Almost. I think 12-hour shifts are quite normal for catering. It seems to sit well with the employees. After all, the more hours you do, the higher your salary. I mean, our employees don't demand shorter shifts. They are okay with that, and it's good for us too. I mean, I know that during the day the pub is well operated and maintained. On average, how many servers are there in the bar? One or two. And one bartender. One during the daytime and two in the evening, but only when there's high demand. I mean, like on Thursday, Friday and Saturday, or when there's a gig. It is the manager who decides how many people to put on shift. Oh, yes, we have a manager as well. Their salary? Well, we have two managers. One is responsible for the paperwork, that is, goods receipt, and working with the United States Automated Information System, which monitors all things alcohol-related. Um, the other one is responsible for front-of-the-house work, that is, a uh, for pop management. One gets about 30 to 35,000 rubles, and other makes around 45 to 60. And we have five chefs. How many chefs work per shift? Usually two. Usually two. How much do they earn? A chef's salary is around 40,000. Let me explain why. We also have a head chef who is a very dear old friend of mine. And he's, well, I'm not really sure what kind of relationship we have. <laughs> but I suppose he's kind of a co-founder. I mean, he runs the kitchen and he makes money from the kitchen and they share the money they make among themselves. I mean, he hires them, picks them up, and pays them depending on how he works on his own shift. But on average, a chef earns about 40,000 rubles a month.
also for 8 to 12 hour shifts. But let's face it, these were all gross salaries before taxes and deductions are taken out, considering how much the state takes from us. Well, that's minus 44%. No, no, wait, wait, say I'm a server. How much is my salary, as you said? 20 to 22,000. If a server earns between 8 and 24... All right, I earn 24. We don't deduct income tax, so you receive all of it. Oh, that means you directly specify take-home pay. Well, the income tax would be 12%, but there's nothing to deduct here. There would be nothing left. We'll have to raise salaries then. Do you think that the salaries are decent generally. I constantly monitor the market. I mean, they're good for industry, average or higher, I'd say. In general, what is your customer demographic? Who comes to a pop? I think they're amazing people. We probably have a very high percentage of regulars. The rest are people who are simply lovely. I don't know how to describe them, but I mean, they are... Let's start with their age. Age-wise, 21 to 27 year olds is probably the largest group. And then the second group consists of 27 to 34 year olds, I guess. And the third group, there are very few of them still there, but they're the ones that have grown up with their pub. They're about 35 to 45 years old. How old is the pub itself? Five. Already five? Yep, already five. How did you celebrate? In a free, willing and fun way with a party. We have a new thing here. My son is a DJ and I'm trying to DJ too. And we celebrated our pub's fifth birthday with a DJ set. Well, you mentioned the wonderful people. Do you often have to deal with the hot-headed customers? We do have a panic button, of course. There are stewards by the door and security in the shopping center. I've never I've never met any rowdy punters and never heard of anything like that. As a rule, any problems are settled right there at the bar, but as far as I can remember, there have been only four, maybe five cases. That was when we had to press the button or interfere somehow, or security had to step in. I mean, that doesn't happen often. Have there been any fights? I've witnessed only two fights, and not inside the pub, of course. They all go outside. I haven't seen any fights inside our pub. Uh, that might just be me, I mean, I forget things like that very quickly. Or they really just that hardly ever happen. You're listening to Understanding Russia. I think it's down to our drink itself. I mean, the product we sell and its price, it all appeals to people who are not predisposed to conflicts. I mean, our pub is like, you're drunk, behave yourself and be cool. I mean, emergencies happen extremely rarely uh, at our place. If it does happen, of course, we try to get to the bottom of it. Uh, how it all started, why it went escalated, what was the reason or why somebody was drunk and refused to pay or why we had to press the panic button. I mean, of course, we discuss all this with our staff and work on how to prevent this from happening in the future. So are there stewards hired by you or not? I only hire separate stewards for events. I mean, we have a panic button, so security at events are more focused on checking passports and keeping out people who come at an event already drunk and don't need the concert anyway. It's basically keeping an eye on things and checking ID. By the way, security staff are included in the rent, right? The shopping center security, yes, it's included in the rent. The security that reacts when we press the button is paid separately. I mean, it's the central security service. And the stewards that work at events are people that I have been working with for a long time. Just confident people who are able to say no, unlike me. I usually gave in and say yes anyway. Well, I can vouch for that. First off, these guys are cool. Them and craft beer. For me, it's like having your hair cut at a barber shop. Do you visit this often over in Vibe? This requires a lot of effort from the bar staff and managers. I mean, we work in such a way so that people don't drink too much and don't get wrecked. A person who has had too much alcohol causes problems that are just as bad for us as for those around them. Nobody likes it when someone is drunk and sleeping at the table or at 
acting inappropriately. So I know for sure that there are members of our staff who are always ready to offer you a glass of water. I know that we have employees who can tell a drunk person to slow down, tell them, hey friend, you've had enough, that's enough. And if anything, order them a taxi and send them home. That's it. Well, if I fall asleep at the table, what will you do to me? We'll wake you up, call you a taxi, offer you a cup of tea or coffee. I mean, first we try to bring you to your senses and call you a cab. But you won't be allowed to sleep at the table. That said, nobody will take you out and rough you up or anything like that. What makes Dekabrist different from other pubs in Belgorod? Well, the way I set it up. The first thing is the door, the light, the colors. The first thing that hits you is probably the design. The second is our customer service. We pay quite a lot of attention to staff training. I believe that our staff's level of training makes the difference. Of course, there are setbacks when we change bartenders or waiters, but we really work a lot on their training. Then I think it's probably uh, our soulfulness, our warm-heartedness. <laughs> I think that in the reviews, when I read the reviews, they say absolutely awesome, everything is very cool. These reviews saying that everything is good make me happy. I don't even need the details, it proves that everyone had done their job well enough. The visitor was comfortable, they had enough attention and were given as much time as they required no more, no less. That is, they had a nice evening. Let's talk about, I'm not sure if it's the right phrase, let's talk about the beer menu. I am responsible for the selection of beer. The main beers on our list are from top Russian craft brews. The best ones. I mean, we definitely have the best brands, 100%. We have beers from the top 10 breweries, the best in the country. You have beer on tap and beer in bottles. Is this all craft beer? Well, by today's standards, I would say so, but if you look more closely, then no. I mean, there is beer from small breweries, which is considered traditional in other countries. Well, we now have the leftmost row, where there are lagers and all the light beers. And there are ales, but they are seen as traditional beer in Germany. We also have some wheat beer there, and those are often called craft beer in our country. I mean, Belgian beer, say, a Belgian dark strong ale, which we call craft, is considered traditional or just ordinary brewed beer in Belgium. I see. More questions about beer. I could never really get my head around it. What is craft beer in general, in brief? In brief, it's beer from small breweries, original and unique, I would say. No matter if it tastes good or not. For example, can we call Baltic a lager craft beer? No, its production scale probably excludes it. If you look at the exact definition, there's a decalital limit on the production of craft beer. Okay, is it the manufacturing plant size that's important? Or, well, let's say, Baltica produces an awesome new craft beer in small amounts. Can it be called craft beer? They have probably had some beers of that kind. If Baltica made something in a very small run and it was cool, of course we would have it in our bar. But Baltica never produces anything in small amounts. I can say that it doesn't make good beer. It makes different beer. But would it be considered craft? I think in terms of production, no. Once again, you have draft beer and beer in refrigerators or somewhere in your stock. What's the percentage of beer that you have in kegs and uh, sell on tap? And beer that people can buy in bottles or cans? Well, it's about from 60 to 40. Cans are popular at the moment. You mean the most popular beer now is the pasteurized one, or what's it called? I mean, one and the same kind of beer can both be poured from kegs or sold in cans. So, 40% is draft beer, right? Yes. I see. Is it all fresh? Sure. That's a weird question. Some types of beer have an expiry date. I don't know, 12 years, for example. I just wanted to tease you a bit. <laughs> well, thanks. Okay, it's fresh. As far as I'm aware. Yes, I think it was fresh. Okay, how many kinds of beer do you keep in stock? We have 18 active taps, but they are not all different kinds of beer. One beer can be on a few taps. There are about 12 different beers on draft. I mean the choice. 12 varieties. Types. What's the term? Well, from 400 to 500. 
Não, não. How many taps do you have precisely? Oh, precisely 18 taps. Four of them are cider taps. There's one for dry cider, taps with semi-sweet and sweet, and another one for a flavored cider. And there are different kinds of beer, I think 10, because some of them may differ just slightly in terms of flavor, but have different strengths. They can all be on the same menu board. So therefore, you are the one that chooses the beer that will be popular. Within reason. I mean, there's a column of tops with popular beer brands. Uh, we also have a beer that's trendy, I mean the kinds of beer that are currently hits in brewing circles, and we have good ones that you want to serve simply because they are rare. They won't be popular and it will take God knows how long to finish the keg or the barrel, but you just want it because it's so special. I mean, if some beer geek comes and finds this on tap, then I'll be very pleased to surprise him. Is your pop often visited by beer geeks? Not often. I mean, most of uh, them are out of towners. People in our city prefer the beer in cans. And there's actually a bigger choice of beer cans. Um, that is, you have a better chance of surprising your guests with beer cans than with your draft beer. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Okay, the next question has always bothered me. Is there any difference between draft and canned beer? <laughs> Look, it's all psychosomatic, because we've done taste tests. A lot of people come in and say, I think the bottled beer is like this and draft is like that. So I say, okay, wait a minute, let's do a blind experiment. We pour a shot of beer from a keg and from a bottle, shuffle them on the bar and then let them taste it. Sometimes people get it right, sometimes they don't. I don't know. In any case, the choice would probably depend on my mood. <laughs> it's just whether I want to hold a bottle or a glass in my hand. I mean, I wouldn't attach too much significance to it. Well, yeah, I think I can taste it when a beer is, let's say, fresh. Yeah, that's what it's about. And also, well, it's strange when you come to a bar and they give you beer from a bottle. That's just not cool. Cool is when you come for a draft beer, which is poured from a tap so that when you take the first sip you can say something like hmm that's sour or that's off is there any difference between beer from the bottom of the keg and from the top? Look, again, it depends on the kind of beer. I mean, a keg is designed so that there is an extraction neck and a suction tube. So when beer is poured out of the tank, it's taken from the bottom first. And the sediment is left there. There is often sediment there and sometimes we will pour away the first four to five liters to flush out the sediment. And we simply lose that. There are people who asks us, leave us the dregs. <laughs> Give me the spoon, I'll polish it off. There are a lot of odd people. What is your favorite beer? I mean, your favorite kind of beer. It's very hard for me to say what my favorite drink is, spirit of beers. I mean, it depends on the season. For example, in the spring I prefer light drinks, and in winter I like stouts and strong beverages, like barley wine. In summer I prefer bitter kinds of beer. I mean, my mood can change. In a certain mood I want certain drinks. What I like about our bar is that you can always find something that suits your mood. Do you like beer? In general, yes. Do you often visit other countries? Twice a year. I'm happy with that. Yeah, I've been to different places and seen some interesting things. How many countries, roughly? About a dozen, probably. I've been to some countries more than once. Mainly Europe? I guess so. Well, judging by the amount of time spent traveling, then it's more likely to be Asia. I've been three times to Thailand and three times to Cambodia. China? Never been there. I think I should visit it someday. How is Russian drinking culture different from the culture in other countries? Perhaps you've noticed significant differences. Professionally, I can tell when people drink in the proper matter, like at our place. I mean, the countries I've been to are all popular among tourists. The places I've been to are mainly tourist-oriented. I usually see tourists, there are few locals there, but it's all the same when people are on vacation. I mean, the drinking culture 
isn't different at all. You walk the streets of Italy in the morning and see people pouring themselves a glass of wine. There are also those who drink beer, others drink coffee. Around midday, people move to the beach. Even in Thailand, the locals bring whiskey. And I just thought, that's brave. Uh, it's 40 degrees Celsius and you go to the beach and drink whiskey. Then it occurred to me that our people would probably do the same thing. And I also observed what people drink in the evening. It's all about cocktails. I mean, vodka and beer. In my opinion, people there drink in the same way as us, the same amount. And they also annoy you with music from a small portable speaker. Well, we're all very similar in the world. Okay, bars and pubs are naturally all about the beer. But what are the elements of foreign bar culture that you like, but we don't have in our country? I really like small semi-home style places. Like in Italy, for example, somewhere in the countryside, where there are literally four or five seats where you can have a coffee and hang out for a bit. I don't know if it can be qualified as a tradition or called a tradition. What do you mean by traditions? I don't know. Playing darts? <laughs> right, darts. In America, for example, at least in the movies, they have a large variety of games there, like beer pong and stuff. They get drunk and their drinking culture is probably all about getting drunk. In Germany, people eat a lot, all kinds of sausages, and they drink beer in large stains, and so on. Yeah, that really fits the term tradition. I mean, there are probably no elements in foreign drinking culture that would amuse me. Or is it everything all right with our drinking culture? Yeah, we're doing fine. And what do you think of how our people drink alcohol? Do they drink a lot or a little? What drinks do they like? Look, in my opinion, Russians have been consuming less alcohol lately. I mean, the amount is less, while the quality is higher. People don't drink very often and in moderate amounts. What is the Russia's favorite drink? Drinks. We have distilled liquor at a bar. It's mainly home brew, somewhere from 40 to 60 percent proof. But the best-selling drinks we have are English pale ales and lagers. This is a beer and low alcohol to boot. Well, that's due to the pub concept. And while a beer costs 300 to 400 rubles, whiskey is obviously more pricey. Yeah, you can buy a bottle of whiskey at a supermarket, it, it won't be that expensive. But drinking whiskey at a bar or pub is a different kettle of fish. That's why. And you don't have a big choice of vodka. As far as I remember, you only stock one brand. Yes, there was a German vodka. And that was also distilled liquor. I don't know uh, why they call it vodka. There was Ben Rock smoked vodka, and Steinreich, good traditional vodka. But there have been problems with importers. I mean, they have stopped supplies of vodka, so we only keep distilled spirits. Unfortunately, there is no foreign vodka. But I think that as soon as it's available... And you don't sell regular spirits, do you? We'll get it in. That is because of the concept in our bar, probably. We want something that can be found at other bars or in the city. I mean, we did a lot of research and got to know the suppliers, found out that they produce something that hasn't been sold in Belgrade yet, something that you are unlikely to find anywhere else, and something that I'm confident of in terms of quality. So if you want vodka, just go somewhere else. And on an unrelated note, what do you like most about our country's culture? By the way, are you Russian? Going back three generations ago to my great-grandmother, uh, she was from Podilsk, uh, that's in Kherson region in Ukraine, and Nikopol, which is in Dnipropetrovsk region in Ukraine. The rest of my roots are Russian, from Smolensk region, uh, and I have very little information on my father. I hardly know any anything about his relatives, but I know that there are relatives with the surname Zaleski. That, I think, has something to do with Belarus and Poland. Let's make it simpler. Do you consider yourself Russian? Yes, of course. And what do you like about our country's culture? What stands out? Again, I look at it as a consumer. I don't really know much about culture. I mean, speaking about the culture as cultural objects that I'm always willing to see and places I'm willing to come back home 
over and over again, then of course. I like the part of Russia that's just outside of Moscow, the Golden Ring, Rostov, for example. Not Rostov on Don, but the one in Yaroslavl region. Yaroslavl city itself, for instance, that part of the country, I'm always ready to hit the road and go there any chance I get. I like the cuisine there, all kinds of influenced vodka, liquor and Russian pancakes. I like that stuff. And I like art of the 12th to 14th centuries. This is the great period of art. You can contemplate the icons painted by Andrei Rublev, for example. That's really nice. Interesting, but the question has more about our customs. What do you like that Russians do? Say, some of our habits, maybe how funny we look when we hold a grudge, I don't know. There's only one thing that is funny to observe. It is very difficult for our people to get together. I mean, Russians are mainly very gloomy or when they first meet each other. And then you see how after three or four hours they literally turn into best mate and kiss you on the forehead, shake your hand and say, Damn, that's sick, that's great. That's it. The acceptance progress goes very slowly, but then you see such a good-natured, warm-hearted and welcoming attitude in the subsequent conversation that keeps surprising me. I guess there are times, and I see when people's attitude doesn't change. They're positive-minded from the very beginning, but that's not common in our country, not welcomed. The initial meeting is usually reserved, but then you become real buddies. What positive things do you like the most? If it still must be about traditions, well, hospitality is a kind of selflessness, dedication, what's the word for it? I don't know. Well, when you're ready to help, empathy, maybe. I don't know. Let's say there's a certain warmth in how we treat each other. What about negative aspects? I thought that you, as an entrepreneur, would single out lack of responsibility. I'm probably just used to dealing with it. I mean, I understand that it's fine for people to not take enough responsibility. First of all, they come to us with the mindset at that period of life when, when they come to work at our bar, their sense of responsibility hasn't been completely formed yet. It's so rare when a person comes and they're straight up responsible. In such cases, you begin to ask yourself, what are they doing here? <laughs> And what traditions or customs or maybe traits would you like Russians to adopt? Damn, listen, I'm definitely gonna fail this question. Do you mean foreign traditions? For example, when you look at Italians, at the kind of family celebrations they have there, very big and festive ones, you can't but want to have it in our country, something like that. Yeah, I wanted to say about carnivals. I really miss street culture, and I wish we had more events on the streets, organized festivity, something fun. It's clear that while it's warm all the time there, we have only four or five months of summer. But still, it's like I want our streets to be more vivid. Is education necessary to run small business successfully? Yes, of course. Although I probably have a bunch of examples of people who succeeded without attending educational institutions. There are also a lot of those who achieved success thanks to their education. And it seems to me that those who went to college and gained success faster and have better results, of course. I mean, I'm all for education. What kind of education is the most helpful? Well, in my case, it was an MBA course at the Learning International Network. It really opened my eyes to management, to how things work, what to do in the beginning and what results to expect, and how to work with it. I mean, I learned about all the procedures there. So management knowledge is useful when you want to run a business, right? Yes. And where can I get that knowledge? Anywhere? I mean, at any university. I think so. But the more hands-on it is, of course, the better. Thank you for listening to Understanding Russia. If you want to contact us, you can get in touch with us via our website at urpod.net, where you can find all our social media links, or via email, understandingrussia at gmail.com. We will be very happy to hear from you. You have been listening to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University.